I take this opportunity to welcome our August panel, which is a global representation of who's who in rectal cancer. It is not my specialty, but it is my neighborhood specialty. I deal with bladders and pelvis, and you guys, rectum is mother-in-law for a urologist or a surgeon. And it's really gratifying to know that Venki could put in such a great panel who I know as neighbors from Detroit to Cleveland, as well as the neighbor specialties. Um, I welcome Dr. Wexner, who is the authority and chairman of uh, the discipline at the Cleveland Clinic. I welcome Delia from Saudi Arabia. Of course, Venki uh, and Emery, my friend who had been helping foundation from time and again in surgeon mentoring in India and uh, Dr. Manish Chandra, who is from London. We are looking for uh, a great discussion on this subject because let me say a few words because uh, about the foundation. Foundation is in existence for almost two decades. And by default, we started with uh, two planks that uh, um, we believed in technology we thought initially technology is to be leveraged to improve patient outcomes. And down our journey, we found technology per se is not effective until there is a user interface or what you call the process of co-creation. And that's why we added in our journey that um, technology, yes, we are very interested in established new technology to be taken to developing world, uh, but we are also focused on surgeon education, procedure innovation. And the example is 90% of the urology procedures in robotic surgery were developed at the Vatikuti Urology Institute. And that's the gratifying thing. Uh, this webinar uh, is focused where uh, in India because it's not only those 62% of work in India is urology, but colorectal and um, Gynecology has come a long way, and um, I would really appreciate the efforts of dedicated surgeons uh, like Dr. Venki Munikrishna, who have established this discipline. And I can sense it that what it means for a patient to uh, use his normal sphincter or to have a colostomy, I can sense it. So you guys are doing a great work. Uh, without uh, much uh, um, uh, between you and the substance, I'll hand it over to Venki Munikrishna to take over and conduct this webinar. I once again thank you for sparing your Saturday morning for the foundation. Thank you, Dr. Bandari uh, and the Vatikuti Foundation for asking us to uh, put this together. The foundation has been doing great work, both online more recently, but physically uh, with robotics and training uh, and mentoring young surgeons all around the world, particularly in India. So, uh, so we're going to put focus on rectal cancer today, which is very dear to uh, our group. And uh, so when Dr. Bandari asked me to uh, put a program together, I was very clear that I need to get the best guys in town to talk about this. And of course, to lead the pack is Professor Wexner. Uh, one word to start off mentor in chief and uh, and uh, chair of colorectal surgery. I'll do the uh, introductions in a bit. And then I have Delia, who's a very dear friend. Uh, we, we just agreed that she's not the rising star anymore. She is the shining star uh, named by Prof. Exner today. So that's how I'm gonna call her. And then Emery Gorgon, who's, who taught me robotics. He was one of the first surgeons who got me onto a console. So I know those days when I was super excited and so I'm sure he can stimulate a few others today. And then, of course, I have my dear friend Manish Chan, who is, how can I describe him? Rockstar, that's it, you know. He, he will have the closing act, as always, to have a final say. And of course, we'll have a short panel in the end, just one question to each one of them to, uh, you know, bring about what, you know, where we're going with all this quality, surgery, advanced disease, and of course, technology. So, uh, so I'm gonna start, kick off this program today, and I'm, privilege to be introducing Professor Wexner, as I said, mentor in chief. He's mentored so many surgeons around the world and particularly our group. Uh, and so 
we're always super excited to talk to him, chat to him, because it's always like, what are you going to do next and where are we going? And you need somebody like that who keeps stimulating you. And so Prof. Exner, for, I think all of you know him around the world, but I still have the privilege to introduce him. So he's the director of Digestive Disease Center and chairman of the Department of Colorectal Surgery at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. Dr. Wexner holds academic appointments in many universities internationally. Uh, recently, he's, he's been appointed editor-in-chief of the prestigious journal of surgery and journals like flying now. Uh, in 1999, he was awarded a fellowship to Royal College of Surgeons of Scotland. In 2008, Council of the Royal College of Surgeons of England recognized him as the highest, with the highest distinction by unanimous election. He has been the president of the American Society of Colon Rectal Surgeons, American Board of Colon Rectal Surgery, the Society of American Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons, and other organizations. He served as a chairman of the Advisory Council for Colon Rectal Surgery to the American College of Surgeons and as board member of the ACS Political Action Committee. In 2012, Prof. Exner was elected to the ACS Board of Regents and in 17 conferred for the Honorary Fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. In 2019, he was designated as Chair of the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer. And that's the reason why Prof. Exner today is going to be talking to us about the National Accreditation Program, quality of surgery, and, and why it's important for surgeons like us to, to, to be chasing quality, because that's what patient ultimately wants from us. Thank you, Prof. Exner, for accepting our invitation. I know you're on holiday. It's early in the morning. Thanks for taking the time. I'm much appreciated. And my apologies to Prof. Barrow because we're disturbing her. I know. Thank you, Prof. Over um, to you. Th thank you very much, uh, Vanky. It's a pleasure. And <clears throat> as I told you, for you, I'll never say no. We're always happy to help you and the rest of my mentees here uh, on the call. It's great to be with everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be the opening act for Manish today, uh, as appropriate. <laughs> he's, the, he's the finale. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bandari, Professor Bandari, for including me in, in the faculty today. And I can't guarantee about the sound here because I'm in a business center at the hotel, which is the best that I could find to uh, not disturb uh, Prof. Berho. I'm going to share my screen here so we can uh, talk a little bit about what you just heard as an introduction, the National Accreditation Program for uh, Rectal Cancer. Back up. Um, and just to give you a little background, we started thinking about this program when my uh, former colleague, uh, the, the uh, department chair at, at uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, Feza Remzi, approached me as president-elect of ASCRS and said, you know, you really should try to do something to improve quality of rectal cancer care. And I sort of accepted that challenge. And we put a group together in 2011 with many people from uh, leaders from colorectal uh, surgery, radiology, colorectal radiology, colorectal pathology, and so on, to try to launch this, uh, this program. And our first job starting in 2011, which continued until I presented our um, program in 2014 to the Commission on Cancer. At that time, I was on the accreditation committee and then subsequently to the American College Surgeons Board of Regents for approval and funding in 2014. We did a lot of these awareness studies to show the nature of the problem. <clears throat> now, this one was not done by our group. This was one of the things that led to our group um, existing. And, and as you can see here, which is kind of amazing, the majority of rectal cancer surgery in, in the US uh, was ending up with permanent colostomies. And this is something we thought could definitely, definitely be improved upon it. And when you looked at the, um, the heat map, as it were, um, from around the country using 21 of our 50 states, county level data, 20,000 parctectomies, turned out that in most places in the US, you would walk out the door without sphincter preservation. Um, and that was a bit uh, frightening to us, to say the least. And, and it seemed excessive because it was highly unlikely that these counties only had patients whose tumors, for example, invaded their sphincters. And then when it was looked a little deeper in another study, uh, also by Rocco Riccardi at the Leahy Clinic, um, it turned out that surgeons who specialize in pelvic floor procedures were much more likely, in other words, colorectal surgeons, surgical oncologists, uh, minimally invasive surgeons focusing on the pelvis, more likely to be the ones performing restorative procedures. 
Um, and so, you know, there's a whole series of studies that Riccardi did, which I think really set the stage for what we subsequently did um, at the um, national level uh, as an interdisciplinary, interinstitutional, intersociety collaboration. So when we compared how we were doing in the US to the rest of the world, we were at the bottom of the pack. And, and you know, it's just incredible when you think about the resources spent in this country, in the US, for healthcare, how we were falling behind all of these other countries, uh, you know, New Zealand, South Africa, UK, Germany, Australia, and so on and so forth, for colostomy rates. And the quality wasn't as high because our circumferential resection margin positivity rate was higher than anywhere else. Um, so higher rate of margin positivity, 17% in the US, and higher rate of abdominal perineal excision. We also knew that throughout Europe in particular, less so in other parts of the world, when centers of excellence were introduced, the impact of those centers was very notable for adherence to best practice, in other words, complete or near complete TME, avoidance of a colostomy, um, lower rates of local recurrence, better overall survival. These were things that were the result of these centers. So as I mentioned, we got together with the four main surgical societies dealing with rectal cancer, American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, Society for Surgery and the Alimentary Tract, Society of Surgical Oncology, plus the American College of Radiology, and they in turn brought in the Society of Abdominal Imaging and then the College of American Pathologists. So we we're able to put together this consortium and put out all of these different awareness papers and you know, the highest impact factor uh, journals really just showing what is the problem uh, and we need to do better. So we, we spent uh, at least three years and actually continue to do so even today. We have papers under peer review and papers in press. To show you some of the things we did, this is the uh, paper showing that, unfortunately, you know, using the National Cancer Database, which is another American College Surgeons Initiative, it's combined with the American Cancer Society. You find uh, we had 31,000 patients with stage two or three rectal cancer. Um, and unfortunately, what we found was that the vast, vast majority, not just the majority, the vast majority, 20. 4,000 roughly these patients were treated in low volume or intermediate volume centers. So these are not per surgeon numbers. These are per center numbers, which is really staggering. Only 6,500 of the patients were treated in higher volume centers. And one would argue that's the number that should be for a surgeon, not per center. Um, and unfortunately in the low and intermediate volume centers, those centers were least likely to, to observe uh, adherence to evidence-based standards. So patients were not getting a fair shake as it were. And that was resulting again in another one of our studies from the National Cancer Database, which by the way, is the world's largest cancer database. Um, that's where we found our 17% margin positivity from the NCDB. So as I mentioned, we, uh, in 2014, right here, I got to present our request to create the NAPRC to the Commission on Cancer Accreditation Committee uh, and then to the ACS uh, Board of Regents. Why the ACS? You know, the ACS started in 1913, and the very first spinoff the ACS created was what was called the Minimum Standard for Hospitals, subsequently became known, known as JACO, or the joint, now the Joint Commission, which is no longer an ACS program but all the rest of these programs continue to be ACS programs that you recognize that you can't open a journal without seeing a NISQIP paper under the leadership of, of Cliff Cove, which is also a colorectal surgeon, national accreditation program for breast centers. This program is different than, than ours, than the rectal cancer program, because you can be NABPC accredited without being commission on cancer accredited. And the commission, we're about to launch our centenary starting at the virtual ACS Congress in two months, we're going to start our centenary celebration for the Commission on Cancer. The NCDB, I've mentioned it before, uh, over 38 million cancers housed in that registry. It is an absolute treasure trove for people doing research and wanting information. So we ended up launching the NAPRC. 2014 to 2017, we spent that time creating a standards manual, which it was revised in, in 2020, um, and the uh, standards manual was then beta tested 
uh, from 2017 to 2018. There were four site visits, us, uh, Emre at the Cleveland Clinic Main Campus, uh, and four other programs. And then in 2018, the actual accreditation visits began. We're supposed to be having our first reaccreditation visit because all accreditations were for three years. Um, <clears throat> this, but because of COVID, everything's postponed. The same societies continue to participate, and we have our updated standards manual, uh, which was published just over a year ago. And of course, this is all online, which is why I gave you the web address. There's certain things that we changed between the first iteration in 2017-18 of the revision. Some of it having to do with the attendance, which you know, one of the very few uh, bright linings to the otherwise black cloud of COVID is the ability to participate as we are today uh, in a virtual sense, which has facilitated people being able to participate in the NAPRC uh, conferences because one of the requirements is that every patient is discussed prior to deciding upon treatment and every patient is discussed after definitive treatment by this group, which must have present at least one person from each of those disciplines. So it, it's been easier for people to participate. And at those conferences, we review initially the imaging, uh, rectal cancer protocol specific uh, MRI, a la Gina Brown, reported in a synoptic report so, uh, as in the Ontario Cancer Care Group, uh, the, the uh, uh, CEA, CAT scan chest, abdomen, pelvis, and the like, and we make a decision. We as surgeons then also use a, uh, a synoptic operative report. And after surgery, uh, Prof. Berho and, and all of the other College of American Pathologists, pathologists show us photographs of our specimens on the big screen in front of the group. We decide on the quality of the operation. We decide on post-operative treatment, any adjuvant therapy is needed. Educational modules have been introduced as well. Uh, the um, rectal cancer one for surgeons introduced by uh, Connor Delaney, uh, the, uh, who started the project as chair of the, uh, what we call fundamentals of rectal cancer surgery, FRCS group, and now of course is our CEO in Florida and president elect of the ASCRS. Are we ready for this type of program? In this anonymous survey with a 42% response rate, we found that most programs were not in fact completely ready, um, <clears throat> but high volume centers, and you'll remember only about one sixth or one seventh of patients are treated at high volume centers, but those are the centers most likely to be compliant with these best practice evidence-based standards. So that study was what people say they're doing, what people actually are doing is in this study, because here we use the National Cancer Database prior to the onset. So this is during the three-year period. This three-year period is when, as you remember, we were creating our initiative. And we looked at a couple of very important performance measures, which we know are critical to outcomes. And we found that in only 28% were all the process measures actually achieved. So there's a lot of work to be done, even by the programs wishing to be accredited. And by our survey of the 1, 000, approximately 1,500 Commission on Cancer accredited uh, hospitals in the US, uh, roughly 200 said that they'd ultimately be interested in seeking accreditation. Um, performance measures, very, very important, of course, circumferential resection margin, nodes, quality of TME, higher performance, but not uh, perfect by any means. Um, we most recently have a manuscript that is, is under peer review with almost 50,000 patients, again, from the NCDB, looking at six process measures and saying, you know, if, if these process measures were followed, all of our standards, all of our 20 standards, if these follow, the process measures were followed, so assessment by the pathologist of the proximal and distal margin, treatment within 60 days of diagnosis, circumferential resection margin, assessed by millimeters by the pathologist, clinical staging, which amazingly isn't done by everybody, tumor regression grading. If all process measures were followed, um, as shown on the slide here, uh, which unfortunately only happened in less than 25% of, of, of patients in the N NCDB, but if it was done, mathematical modeling, we'd save about 600 lives a year in the U.S. So there's definite value to the program. Currently, the programs are accredited at these various institutions. And you can see we did, we did achieve our goal of being inclusive 
all different types of medical centers, a lot of heterogeneity, uh, and people around the world watching today know we have about 90 countries online are not necessarily familiar with our geography, but suffice to say it's from the East Coast to the West Coast and from the Mexican border to the Canadian border, all types of programs. And another, if you, if you look here, uh, there's another uh, almost 70 programs in various stages of accreditation. So we'll, we should be over 100 programs, I'm guessing, by the end of 2022, which gets us halfway to where we thought we would be. So I know that's a lot of information in, in a very short period of time, but I'm, I'm delighted again uh, to have the opportunity to share this information with you. Uh, thank you, Venki. Uh, thank you, folks at the Vatikuli Foundation again for uh, indulging me and allowing me to give the opening talk to this meeting. I look forward to the questions later. Thank you so much. That was very insightful, very important. I think that's what we're trying to achieve all around the world. Uh, it's a challenge to maintain quality and to be audited so that our patients uh, get the best what we can offer. So. Uh, I will come back to Prof on the panel for one question later. So next, I would like to, uh, you know, in the program we have Professor Embry Gordon. Embry Gordon is a great friend, one of the kindest uh, people you'll meet. Uh, and so Embry is been recently appointed as uh, section head, colorectal surgery, oncology, and the director of endoluminal surgery center. Low GI at the Cleveland Clinic. He's also holder of the Krauss Lieberman Trust Endo Chair in Laparoscopic Colorectal Surgery. Dr. Gorgon joined Cleveland Clinic Department of Colorectal Surgery as a full time faculty in 2011. He's certified by the American Board of Colorectal Surgery and the American Board of Surgery. Uh, Dr. Gorgon hails from uh, Istanbul, where you've been kind to invite me. Beautiful country, beautiful people. And uh, after his uh, undergrad there and uh, he did his clinical fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic, Department of Colorectal Surgery. He moved to New York City for an advanced laparoscopic colorectal fellowship at the New York Presbyterian uh, uh, Will Cornell. In New York, he, he uh, decided to complete his ACGME approved residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Will Cornell, and has also completed specialty training in colorectal surgery, laparoscopic surgery at the same center and, and the MSK CC Center. Dr. Gorgon is a pioneer in endoluminal surgery. Uh, he's pioneered this in, in the Cleveland Clinic uh, and, uh, and has developed so many different approaches. Uh, and so uh, I'm looking forward to welcoming to India for, uh, for him to teach us more on the subject. I'm, I'm looking forward to visiting him as well, learning from him. Uh, he holds uh, numerous professional memberships uh, uh, across the world. He's, uh, so Emery. Over to you. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation. And uh, I know you've got classes. He's doing an EMBA, which I hope I'll do one day. I think all surgeons should learn uh, some business management skills. So yeah, you, you are an inspiration to many, particularly to me. So over to you. Thank you for uh, also including me into, the, into this uh, panel, this uh, prestigious panel with many uh, very, very well-known, worldwide known uh, colleagues and that we are all friends with. Uh, and also I'd like to do thank Dr. Bandari as well in Vatukuti Foundation. Uh, I, I traveled to India and learned a lot about India as well and really enjoyed my trip back then. And that's when we first met with you and uh, that was the first of many other trips after that. And uh, hopefully we'll have many more uh, coming up in the future. Uh, so we'll talk about surgery for rectal cancer, and I want to talk about robotics. Obviously, uh, this is uh, also the foundation of our meeting today as well, to some degree. And Dr. Wexner did an outstanding uh, introduction to why it is important, and uh, and in the United States, how we can improve this, and and in the world. So uh, these are my disclosures. As you know, uh, rectal cancer surgery re, re, uh, was re, 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 uh, it was reinvented almost by Dr. Bill Hild in 1980s. And TME, we all know, uh, is is the mainstay of the good quality treatment. Uh, un, un, unfortunately, still we don't have a good answer uh, to what is the best approach for creating the or doing the best TME, how we can perform our TMEs. So open surgery provides significant morbidity and long recovery 
and pain control is also disadvantages and of course adhesion formation and, and hernias. That's why laparoscopy was possibly an option and uh, an answer for this. But and when you look at the literature, there are close to 100 randomized studies, more than 300 papers on laparoscopy and looking at advantages and disadvantages and all boil down to that in patients with high body mass index, male gender, narrow pelvis, and inexperienced surgeons with big bulky tumors, uh, the, the, the outcomes are not very favorable with laparoscopy. I mean, uh, they, you will find some surgeons that uh, will uh, debate that, but certainly this is what the uh, literature suggests. And with multiple also firings, there are higher leak rates. And you can understand that easily with straight instruments, getting this cur curvature down deep in the pelvis is a problem. Well, ECOSOC uh, uh, by Dr. Fleshman, as well as Alacart from Australia, did actually look into that question, comparing laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy with open surgery. And really indeed, they concluded that uh, laparoscopy did not provide any major advantage and it was a non-inferiority uh, trial. But, and these are, if you read these lines, these are from discussion from a JAMA, JAMA paper from Dr. Fleshman from ECOSOC that wristed instruments may provide the need, needed control in the deep pelvis. And placing these instruments in line with side walls of the pelvis and controlling remotely provide ergonomic visibility. These are actually the characteristics of the existing robotic platform. So maybe robot was the answer for that. And indeed, when you look at uh, uh, robotics trials comparing to laparoscopy, of course, uh, retrospective, uh, non-randomized, uh, uh, some prospective, but not randomized. When you look at those studies, you see always with the robot lower circumferential positive uh, margin rates, lower conversion rates, uh, length of stay is shorter with robotic surgery and less postoperative pain. But these are mainly non-randomized studies. What about randomization? And that was where, when roller trial uh, was conducted and, uh, uh, by Pigasi and, uh, and Associates. And that did, uh, that did actually, the primary outcome was conversion to open. Is really robot can decrease the conversion uh, to open surgery and as a result, maybe improved outcomes. And that unfortunately also failed to show any major advantage of uh, robotic surgery, uh, except a small subgroup with, uh, with in male obese patients and, uh, and, and tumors that are very, very low. Uh, in this group of patients that was only shown and benefit. But so this, so that we, we, here we are, uh, laparoscopy is not in the, in the pelvis an advantage over open surgery, as well as we don't have any clear advantage of robot, robotic surgery, at least if you look at the studies, uh, but still uh, yet again, robotic surgery gains momentum. There is more and more uh, interest in robotic surgery. What are the reasons for this momentum? Uh, I, I think some of these are that the newer generation of surgeons requesting robotic training to be including into, into the, their curriculum, and they wanna learn robotic surgery. Also hospitals are using the robot as marketing tool. And, uh, and also patients come to us uh, convinced that robot is uh, be better. And as, uh, as Dr. Bandari mentioned also, we, we wanna uh, support technology because that's how we get better in, in, in any field better car industry or cell phone industry. So that's certainly gonna get us better quality in many aspects. Uh, but these are, despite these, of course, skepticism and critics still persist, but we need to adapt ourselves. If, if I would have asked you, if you ever had your patients ask for robotics, probably most of you would say yes, but that's not necessarily always what patients want. Uh, really, they want the good quality care. Uh, but it, needless to say, they are, uh, multiple multiple advantages of robotic technology when when we use in in robot for the ones that use robot we know uh, we we have better visualization uh, the 3d quality is certainly an advantage when we do operations we have now ultra fast uh, fast vessel sealers and the icg or uh, indigo cyan in green monitoring is readily available the, uh, these are all advantages of robotic uh, surgery that we can 
we, we may struggle with the, when we do laparoscopy or open, sur open surgery, it may take a while. There's now a, also a recent debate about the uh, battle between robotic and TATME. Maybe that came at, as, as you, uh, many of you know here, the TATME maybe was proposed as a solution to the problem, uh, especially with the roller trial and previous randomized trials, not having a good answer about the advantages of minimally invasive surgery. This seemed to be a, 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 a hero. However, I, as you most might know, I mean, this is also coming off favor a little bit to an extent, but this is a multi-center match comparison that Florida group was involved with that looked at head-to-head comp uh, -head comparison, transanal to robotic mesorectal and pretty much similar uh, uh, outcomes for in this uh, multi-center study, but the distal margin was slightly uh, closer with TATME and a word of caution. Be careful with TATME, especially with the distal margin was, was stated, concluded in this paper. Additionally, pre-existing skill set, available equipment, and mentoring is important, whichever technique you do. And that's what I have been thinking and saying for years. What is the best surgical technique? I do think, like that previous paper mentioned, the technique you would feel confident in which you can provide this type of a good quality specimen. That goes back to Dr. Rexner's talk that we really, in, in our PRC requirement, quality metrics are important. We need to have good circumferential resection margin, good distal resection margins, good high ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery vessels, whether you can accomplish uh, uh, specimens or surgical uh, specimens like this, uh, either open laparoscopy, robotic, or TATME with laparoscopy, that's important. For, for most of us, uh, Manish, uh, uh, Venki, myself, uh, probably robotic is the way to go. This is one of our earlier uh, pictures with SI platform where we can really do good TMEs and ex even exteriorize these specimens from ileostomy site. Uh, good mobilization, good circumferential resection margins, as well as good distal resection margins. And we can extract these specimens and create the ostom even from, from the same extraction site with good recovery and uh, low hernia rates and so forth. Uh, this shows our port placement in the right lower quadrant with the SI. Of course, uh, with the S, uh, XI platform, things are a little bit more modified. The setup in the operating room and good stapling uh, with endorrhistic staples and recently sure form, even you know, this technology is constantly evolving to better angulation, 360 degree uh, articulation. These are different than our laparoscopic staples that we can take advantage of technology. Advanced XI platform, certainly docking easy, faster, much quicker. And the SI placement is modified with here two yellow and two. these are moved up in a straight line of course when these we teach in our uh, hands-on courses to our uh, colleagues uh, and hopefully we'll be doing that in India in other countries as well as uh, as, as 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 we as we continue to do that uh, there are intangible advantages of robotic surgery for example this was a patient that had a positive leak test bubbles and exactly in this cross a stapling area, and this is a 2.5 magnified view of the uh, of the field. Uh, this needle is an RB needle. This is much smaller than an SH. SH looks giant here, so don't be fooled by this uh, look. It's very magnified, very deep in the pelvis. There's no way we can suture this type of an anastomosis uh, with laparoscopy or even with uh, open surgery. We need to have technology to be able to work in that narrow tight space. So these are some intangible advantages. Another advantage I want to share with you here, for example, uh, lateral pelvic lymph node dissection. This is one of my earlier first videos that uh, I had no pre prior experience with robotic la or la lateral pelvic lymph node dissection, but you have such a controlling dexterity that you can uh, harvest lateral pelvic lymph nodes with robotic surgery safely without getting any fear or but having a full control in the field, ureter is medialized, external and uh, artery and vein is uh, skeletonized, internal iliac artery you can see and uh, collect your um, 
specimens. This is a patient that has, for example, a very complex uh, rectal cancer with also uh, left ureter cancer and kidney cancer. I mean, look at when you look at these CAT scan images, you can see how this is an open case. Doesn't have to be necessarily. Uh, 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 there we go. Uh, this is ligation of the IMA. As you get, you know, more facile and improve your experience, you can certainly do even complex cases and they will, and provide them the advantage of minimally invasive surgery. This is ligation of the IM, IMA. You can see that. Uh, medial to lateral approach and, uh, and showing the, uh, the ureter and kidneys in the retroperitoneum very pronounced, very uh, enlarged. But you can do this dissection uh, uh, even with the robot. Uh, and this was an APR patient and extrise everything from the perineal opening. And this patient takes advantage of, uh, of a minimally invasive approach. And here we see the removal of the left ureter all the way down to the bladder and big specimens like that can be, can be extraterized. Uh, or a patient with liver metastases that we do at our center, uh, uh, completely uh, calcified or embedded, uh, encompassing the entire retroperitoneum. See these are IMA ligated, gonadal vessels ligated and completely removal of the uh, retroperitoneal tissues. I mean, there's no way easily or, I mean, very maybe skilled hands uh, do, to be able to do these uh, laparoscopically, but you can see these uh, lymphatic uh, channels as well and clip them, prevent chyle leaks and completely skeletonize uh, aor aorta even uh, in cases when needed. Of course, these are extreme cases uh, and not to start up cases, but as, as experience uh, as develops, as you see here, robotic uh, aortic skeletonization, these even tough cases can be performed. And lastly, uh, uh, now single port. This is a patient with a ure, uh, ure, uh, ureter stricture. And, uh, and this is maybe getting us into the future endorobotics, submucosally uh, dissecting and harvesting these uh, uh, rectal mucosal, mucosa and providing a donor, donor uh, mucosa for the for our urologists for, for re-implanting and uh, taking care of strictures in the, uh, in the, in the urethra. So this is a very long, uh, very long specimen uh, of the rectal, rectal mucosa, as you see that harvested in 45 minutes with endorobotics, uh, with SP da Vinci, whereas, you know, with uh, endoscopic submucosal with flexible endoscopy would have taken three, four hours to accomplish a, a, a specimen like this. It is important, no matter what you do, to do you know your own data. Uh, this is a paper that we looked at obese patients in our group, uh, did show significant improvement with robotic surgery, 6.4 days versus 8.4 days in laparoscopic group. So important that when you start your robotic surgery, you collect your data and look at these. As we did in our paper uh, that we showed in obese patients quicker return of bowel movements and length of stay, uh, even in om om obese patients uh, compared to laparoscopic surgery when we did uh, 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 robotic surgery. Uh, cost will be always uh, uh, an enemy for, 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 for surgeons that will be performing robotic surgery, but it is uh, for us as surgeons, as well as companies, uh, important that, uh, uh, that value of care should be increased. Uh, and with with increasing experience, we can certainly, as surgeons, reduce these costs, doing a better job with less op post-operative stay and morbidity. And as we have seen in our studies in the past, that uh, with increasing experience and cost-conscious approach, we can certainly increase the value of care and make the cost uh, less of a uh, bother. So uh, today, we, uh, there are more than 40 companies actively developing new surgical robots as well. And, uh, and I can tell you that we are no longer on the edge of a uh, robotic revolution, but more that already happened. But we are on the edge of revolution within, within, within robotic surgery itself. What that means is that more autonomous system, true surgical rob robots will be developed with artificial intelligence, or imaging technologies be, being incorporated maybe uh, 
Manish might talk about that a little bit. Uh, uh, but no matter what, again, cost limitation uh, for emerging technologies remains the main point. And the, the, this needs to be addressed for, for, for companies, new coming uh, marketers, and they need to be uh, conscious about that when they uh, bring something into the market, as well as resurgence, how we can responsibly introduce these into our practices. Uh, so it, uh, one last uh, word on flexible endoscopy. Uh, or flexible uh, robotic systems. I, as we know, the SP, I've been utilizing this in my practice as well, certainly is uh, innovation and it is helpful as you have seen in previous video I tried to share with you. However, uh, the, the future will be more flexible robotic platforms. This, uh, you, know, you see here, this is semi-flexible, I can say more that we can even inside of the intestine come up higher uh, in the colon and do more. Uh, in even colonic uh, approach as well as higher rectal approaches. And also introduction of more autonomous and, uh, and sem uh, true surgical robots where artificial intelligence will be in, uh, incorporated into the technologies. So I would like to conclude my uh, talk here that the robotics should be viewed as one of the several technologies as a modern surgeon, and certainly something that we, sh we, sh we, we, we should all become familiar with and that will uh, evolve to next generation robots uh, in the very near future. Thank you again for your time. And I apologize for the uh, microphone issue in the earlier at the beginning. Thank you, Andre. That's a fabulous talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure there will be lots of people thinking, yeah, we need, we're there or we're getting there. So excellent. I'm looking forward to the amazing things you're gonna be doing in the near future. Right, so we have, our shining star, Delia Cortez Coral. Uh, so she is an exciting talent. She's my great friend and oh, one of Bexner's favorite mentees. So, so introducing her to all of you, uh, Dr. Gural is a general digestive surgeon specialized in peritoneal surface surgical oncology and colorectal, and is a colorectal cancer consultant at King Khalid Hospital, Saudi Arabia part-time and another and the rest of the time she spends her uh, uh, you know work life at the hospital universitario principe di Asturias, i think madrid uh, in spain so she wears lots and lots of hats i don't know how she manages to do that she's in the board of directors of prevention of networks screening committee of the european cancer prevention plan uh, on the so board of directors Board of Directors of the SEOQ, Spanish Society of Surgical Oncology, Board of Directors of FESIO. I'm panting, puffing. How do you do all these things, Delia? And so she's in the Adobe Advisory Board of the Colorectal Disease Journal. She is on the social media team of the Surgery Journal, very active. She's an Instagram star. Oh, that's social, but also professional. Uh, and yeah, and um, she's been a huge mentor to lots of young surgeons in advanced diseases, peritoneal disease, PIPAC, IPEC. So we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Uh, Delia, over to you. Thank you so much, my dear friend, uh, Venki. Um, thank you, Professor Vandari, and congratulations to both of you on the organization of this event. Um, it's such an honor to be part of this panel. Let's talk about what a patient can expect when a colorectal surgeon finds this, peritoneal metastasis. And 30 years ago, it was a tragedy to find peritoneal metastasis of colorectal origin, but it can be said that this, this is not a fatal disease anymore. It is true that without treatment, uh, medium overall survival is really poor, around six months, with palliative surgery and systemic uh, therapy is around 24 months, but now we can talk about uh, treating our patients with curative intent, thanks to a combined treatment, uh, which is uh, cytoreductive surgery, hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, known as HIPEC, and systemic chemotherapy. In colorectal peritoneal metastasis, data from an early randomized trial found a significant survival benefit uh, with cytoreductive um, <clears throat> plus mitomycin C-based HIPEC followed by systemic chemotherapy versus systemic chemotherapy alone. 
and other prospective cohorts by Elias, Franco, and Esquivel uh, have validated these results. Thanks to this treatment, 16% of our patients will not develop recurrence at five years, so we can say that 16% of our patients can be treated thanks to this treatment. Many of my colorectal surgeons' friends ask me about the steer around the Prodigy 7 trial. So I'm going to explain about it. The Prodigy 7 trial tested cytoreactive surgery plus oxaliplatin-based uh, HIPEC compared with cytoreactive surgery alone. Uh, so it was very interesting. They aimed to find what is the benefit of adding HIPEC to cytoreactive surgery. But this trial failed to demonstrate an improvement in overall survival or recurrence-free survival. The good news is that, are that cytoreductive surgery plus systemic chemotherapy in expert centers achieved a better than expected uh, medium overall survival of 41 months. This finding highlighted the major role of completeness of cytoreductive surgery as the principal prognostic factor of uh, patient outcome and reinforces the message that patients with peritoneal metastasis must be referred to a specialized centers as all patients with liver metastasis are treated by liver surgeons. This graph shows that there is no survival difference for patients with liver or with peritoneal metastasis when, when treated with treatment. Uh, furthermore, patients with low peritoneal cancer index, which is PDI, have better prognosis than patients with liver metastasis. Tool, um, to estimate the individualized risk of developing peritoneal metastasis for our colorectal patients. You can find it uh, online, it's free. And it was developed by the Karolinska Institute and it was later uh, validated. So peritoneal metastasis of colorectal origin are completely predictable. So why all the steer after the results of Prodigy 7 were presented first at the ASCO, during the ASCO conference in 2018. And after that, it took uh, almost three years to be published. An avalanche of letters to the editor were published warning about several methodological weaknesses uh, for this trial. Uh, first um, of all, regarding power calculation, an 18 month 18 months improvement in overall survival was expected. There is no systemic treatment, no surgical treatment, no immunotherapy that could provide such an improvement in for oncologic colorectal patients. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, the trial was really underpowered from its design. Cytoreductive so, surgery alone was really underestimated, and the actual medium over survival for cytoreductive surgery alone is 41 months, and it was estimated to be 30 months, and as a consequence, sample size was wrongly estimated. It, this is very important because 25% of the enrolled patients had a PCI above 16, and it has been reported that above 16, the impact of cytotactic surgery and HIPEC for our patients is really um, almost nothing. So this is, um, with uh, PCI it's very important because PCI is the most important prognostic, prognostic factor. Thus, it should be not only a certification factor, but an inclusion criteria, and it was not in this trial. So uh, as a consequence, uh, this, uh, number of patients with such a high PCI could influence morbidity and mortality, but it's very interesting that when we analyze, when we focus on the subgroup of patients with a PCI between 10 and 15, we observed that there, there was a statistical significant overall survival benefit. In addition, there was a crossover of 16 patients. That means that 16 patients in the control arm only receiving cytoreductive surgery. When they develop a recurrence, they went to another centers and they were treated by sector reduction and HIPEC. And those patients were not excluded from the uh, trial. So of course it can interfere with the results. This is only, uh, this only proves how complicated it is to design and to develop trials in surgical oncology. Uh, but we have, we have learned many lessons from the Prodigy 7 trial. First, cytoreductive surgery is the main responsible factor for the survival uh, benefits observed. That cytoreductive surgery must be 
uh, done by experienced surgical oncologists in specialized centers, and it seems that there is a benefit for the subgroup of patients with a BCI between 10 and 15. And this is not the end of HIPEC in colorectal cancer, of course, but it looks like this is the end for this uh, protocol of HIPEC tested in this trial, which was HIPEC with high, high dose of xaliplatin, 460 milligrams per square meter for, a, for 30 minutes um, uh, delivery. Uh, it has been proven that it increases the risk of intraperitoneal bleeding, so uh, this protocol should be abandoned. And in addition, we have now three negative phase three trials with this protocol, Prodigy 7, Colopec, and Prophylogip. So fewer trials uh, should further investigate the role of the optimal type of HIPEC for colorectal peritoneal metastasis. What about, what if you have a patient in your hospital with both colorectal cancer, peritoneal metastasis, and liver metastasis in Cronus. Of course, you can refer the patient because we can treat now these patients. We are treating the, all the diseases at the same time, and but we are more restrictive. We only treat patients with, with a BCI uh, maximum of 12 and up to three liver metastases, and uh, liver disease must be chemosensitive. And we are doing now, we are moving from a maximally invasive approach <laughs> to a minimally invasive approach. We are doing now cytoreductive surgery, laparoscopic peritonectomy. We can deliver HIPEC by laparoscopy. We are beginning to do, do uh, robotic peritonectomies. And it's been proven that laparoscopic peritonectomy is safe and feasible, and it brings all the advantages of the minimal invasive approach to our patients. Less complications, shorter hospital stay, and this is the most important. Uh, we've been, we have reported that we have the same or slightly better overall survival with our patients of, with colorectal peritoneal metastasis treated by laparoscopic uh, peritonectomy when we compare with the open technique. We can as well offer our patients personalized intraperitoneal therapy. We have now several tests to try to test the chemosensitivity or the response of the peritoneal metastasis to HIPEC with different drugs. We can grow uh, organoids to try to test chemosensitivity. Uh, but what about these patients? This patient for sure is completely unresectable. There is no chance for cytoreductive surgery for him. All the small bowel cirrhosis is covered with peritoneal nodules. Uh, so this patient in many hospitals, they, can of, they cannot offer them, this patient, nothing at all, uh, but a palliative treatment with palliative systemic chemotherapy. But now we have another option for this patient, which is to deliver by a minimal invasive approach with only two ports to trocars, uh, pressurized intraperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy, as known as PIPEC. So PIPEC was born as a palliative technique to treat mainly ascites and to relieve the abdominal symptoms, but now it can be delivered as new adjuvant uh, therapy uh, for patients with unresectable peritoneal metastasis with a very high PCI for colorectal patients is above 16 and chemoresistant uh, tumors. We are using PIPEC to try to decrease uh, the amount and uh, the number of peritoneal nodules. And this is how it how PIPEC works. We do with only two ports, we turn liquid chemotherapy into a thanks to this uh, metallic port, which is called Capnapen. And this is the sequence of treatments. Uh, we combine systemic chemotherapy with uh, PIPEC, as this is a minimal invasive procedure. It's very well tolerated and it can be repeated for the patients until we and we try to make our patient resectable. So this is the evidence uh, regarding PIPEC published in the Lancet Oncology. Uh, up to 86% of our colorectal patients had a clinical response, and this is very impressive because we are talking about chemo res patients resistant with resistant to systemic intravenous chemotherapy with an overall survival of 16 months, which is as well impressive as we are talking about patients with unresectable disease, but more importantly, around 18% of those patients will be finally candidates for cytoreduction and HIPEC. This is my team in Saudi Arabia. Here we are doing PIPEC for a patient with a very advanced um, disease. And in conclusion, PIPEC is the present and the future for patients with unresectable, high PCI or chemo-resistant disease. PIPEC is safe and well-tolerated treatment, and we have numerous ongoing trials testing PIPEC. 
But the most uh, and the take home message is that all patients with peritoneal metastasis should be referred to a hospital with a unit of peritoneal surface oncology uh, because we have a treatment with curative intent for them, which is cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. But even those patients with synchronous liver metastasis or with unresectable disease uh, must be referred because now we could offer all of them different treatments. Thank you very much. Wow. Fabulous talk, Delia. Thank you so much. As always, there's so much hope because, uh, you know, uh, now when I come across this disease, I'm like, let's call Delia, you know, because that's what we need to. Uh, because in, looking at my own practice, uh, I do, you know, standard disease. I, I haven't got the time and effort to also do, I'm sure a lot of surgeons do it, but I think in itself, it's a specialty. It really is. And, you know, we need to put all the components together as a service to achieve, uh, you know, to offer something to our patients who come with advanced disease. And it's not a small thing. I don't think you could be a jack of all trades. I think that's been the theme, uh, you know, because we're not even talking colorectal cancer. We're talking rectal cancer, then we're talking quality, we're talking robotics, we're talking advanced disease. You know, just putting it together and being one half fits all, I don't think it will. Fabulous talk, thank you so much. And I'll have one question at the end for you. Of course, and then to bring the closing act uh, of the uh, masterclass is my good friend, Professor Manish Chan. Now there's always a reason why I always have Manish in the end, because you know these meetings can be long and you always need something exciting too, mostly because he's always on a flight, you know, giving a talk in this part of the world and that part of the world. And, you know, he's always running, talking in, you know, in a business center in the airport or somewhere. So that's why it's always good to have Manish in the end because you can lift the whole meeting up and finish it off. And he's one, you know, I met Manish six, about four or five years ago and we had a chance meeting and uh, he's inspired me from that meetings uh, in a bar in London. I remember that day very well. And from then on, it's, you know, his support and inspiration and mentoring has helped us develop our program uh, back in India at Chennai. And uh, he's one of our collaborators. There's so much we discuss both on and off work. And I'm so happy to have you here, Manish, with us today. Uh, Manish is a, a fabulous colorectal surgeon at the University of London Hospital. Uh, he holds a, uh, a honorary professorship with the Apollo Hospitals in India uh, and Alzara Hospital in Dubai. Uh, he's a clinical academic at the uh, University of London. Uh, he's also recently appointed as Chief Medical Officer for the fabulous AIS channel uh, with Professor Lacey's uh, inputs. Uh, he has clinical interests and expertise in minimal maze surgery, uh, laparoscopic and robotic for colorectal cancer, for which he's recognized around the world as a trainer, a key opinion leader. He's got a special interest in endometriosis surgery, which uh, he's you know, demonstrated uh, around the world again. He has huge research interests and has a fabulous research team uh, uh, doing work in surgical technology, which includes image-guided surgery, fluorescence, AI, and augmented reality. He's published over 150 peer reviewed articles and continues to research into these areas uh, with and the integration into next generation robotic platforms. Thank you, Manish. Thanks. I know you're a busy man, but uh, as always, we need a closing act. And uh, thanks for being the closing act. And uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Venki, for that um, very kind and generous introduction. Um, and I very much look forward to joining you um, in Chennai, hopefully um, soon. Um, uh, and we can um, we can all meet up in person again. I'm going to talk with uh, sort of finish with some um, interesting but light-hearted material about what you um, may see coming in the come in the in the next few years. But the backdrop of all of this has been it has been very difficult over the last 18 months. And this paper from the Global Surge and COVID Surge Collaborative have estimated the number of paper the number of patients that have had cancellations of elective surgery. And we're beginning to see more and more cases now and longer and longer waiting lists as our priorities and resources are directed towards dealing with acutely ill COVID patients. But within this, there surely has to come an opportunity for us to redesign some of our services and redeploy some of our resources. And, and this really is Darwinism at, at its best. It's not about the biggest and strongest that survive, but it's those who adapt that are actually the most successful 
when hit by any catastrophe. And that's what we must seek to do. And that includes using technology now appropriately and in a way that is not only um, amazing for us to, 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 to deal with, but also efficient as well. And, 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 I'm, and I said this some time ago that, that no surgeon works at 100% efficiency um, all the time. I mean, that, that's just not humanly possible. A, um, an athlete will not reproduce at 100% level the same time. I mean, we've recently seen, and this might be a sore point for many of the listeners, but um, India pulled off a, a, an absolutely fantastic test win just um, over a week ago at Lords, but absolutely capitulated to England this afternoon. So we can see that it's not possible to perform at that same high level all the time. And perhaps that's where um, artificial intelligence and technology can bridge the gap between us as human beings trying to work at 100% and being able to work at 100%. So how, do, how does practice need to change as we emerge? Well, we need to think about efficiency. We need to think about precision. We need to think about resource allegation and we need to reduce risk. And all of these things together have a synergistic effect. And that means that we can then plow through these elective cases that are waiting, but also deliver patients safe optimal care as well by getting it right first time, avoiding complications. Of course, there are often barriers to technology and adoption to technology, and this is from a Forbes article from a few years ago. And some of the comments made are, are that we don't always know what need we're trying to fulfill. So we get given a technology and told it's fantastic, but actually, does it really do anything in our case that's practice changing? Is it going to slow us down? Of course, all technologies come with expense. And, 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 and the other thing that we see is that technology can sometimes be seen as impersonal. So we've seen a huge rise in telemedicine, for example, but one of the things that patients don't like about telemedicine, of course, is that it's impersonal and you don't have that same rapport between doctor and patient. But we have seen huge rises in other parts of our lives. In 25 years, these companies, which we can't now do without, have now become a staple of all of our lives. We can't remember a world without Apple products, without YouTube, without Google. But 25 years ago, when, when certainly when I was at, um, at primary school during this time, th this is, th these technologies just simply didn't exist. So we have seen that they can come into our um, everyday lives and existence quickly, but we need to do it in a safe way. So what are the things that we can do in our own practice as we move into precision and how are we going to use technology towards us? Well, one of the first things is to standardize, because if you standardize any process, whether it be in healthcare or whether it be outside healthcare, you will lead to a reduction in error. And we've seen this in the aviation industry, which many of our protocols are taken from. If you have a standardized way of doing things, the same thing every time, checklists, people having designated responsibilities, people doing things in a synoptic way, you're going to find that, that you get reduction in error. So examples of that may be, do we need to be using drains all the time? Do we need to be using good homeostasis? Do we need to be using good stapling techniques, avoiding multiple firings? Should all patients be getting bundles of care? So you have antibiotics given with mechanical bowel prep for left-sided resections to reduce the risk of surgical site infection and perhaps even an astomotic leak. And then, of course, should we standardize the way that we operate? If you bring all of this together, you will lead eventually to a reduction in error. So this is an example of stapling. And, and Emery showed earlier on what the robotic staplers are capable of. This is um, a laparoscopic. Um, procedure. And here, when we're doing this, what we want to do is get across in a maximum of two firings. And that may be fiddly. We need to be gen gentle and delicate. We don't want to ruin the uh, mesorectal flat or tear the serosa around uh, the rectum, but we want to get across in one firing because we know 
that that is um, a reduction, or we know that more than two firings leads to an increased risk of a leak. So in this particular video here, we can see that there's a single staple line going from anterior to posterior, and that's the staple line there. And if we have these kind of technical reproductions, so we can do this in a repeatable fashion, we will see our own audited results improve and a reduction in error. And that's using technology appropriately. So not just being given a stapler and told to use it, but using it appropriately as well and being adequately trained to do that. This is an example actually of an automated stapler that, that, that I use. And one of the advantages I found is that there's a lot less micro trauma. And if I follow this video on a little bit, I'm about to staple here. I always do the bottom end of myself because I think it's the most important part of the operation and I don't want to leave it to chance. Um, so here, same window as you get with most staplers. Um, there is a little safety catch that you can see as well, which I'm just pointing to here. And if you look, I'm firing this one handed with no micro movement at all. Very different from some of the interesting choreography that you'll see when people are trying to do the staple gun from below, standing on stools, standing with their shoulders in certain positions. But that's green, that green light means it's been stapled and you get very good quality, robust staple, um, donuts because it's the same action again and again and again. This is the paper uh, or one of the papers that suggests that if you do have more than two um, uh, staple firings that you get an increased risk of an anastomotic leak. So that's standardization of a particular part of the surgery, but there's a paper that I wrote with Professor Wexler and my colleague Brendan Moran from Basingstoke. And what, what do we actually, what, what technique should we adopt? If you're doing a rectal cancer, there are four recognized ways of doing this, open laparoscopic, TA, TME, and robotic. And uh, somebody that's been fortunate enough to, to do um, a few, a fair number of these in, in, in each individual technique, I think Emery is absolutely right that the future of all of this is going to be robotics when it becomes more widely available to everybody at a cost-effective price. Um, and that's what we're going to see. Professor Wexner has spoken many times about any form of minimally invasive surgery is better than open. So I think we've, we're moving away from that open surgery is the gold standard. I think minimally invasive surgery is now the gold standard and open surgery is the fallback position, but it's not the gold standard anymore, um, despite what, what um, some of the articles over the years have been telling us. Robotics, well, we've spoken about this. Here's an example of many fictional robotics, popular robotics over the years. Um, interestingly, what do all of these robots have in common? What they have in common is that they all talk and think and are autonomous. They, they are able to make their own movements. They are able actually to have their own thoughts and have a decision-making process. But that's very different from the actual origin of the word robot, which comes from the Czech language and is akin to being in slavery or bondage to one's master. And that's actually the true type of robot that we see today. We don't see an autonomous robot making its own decisions. We see this kind of robot, and this is um, one of the cases that I did along with um, Dr. Munikrishnan in Apollo Chennai um, and his team. And I'm controlling an instrument remotely, but I'm in complete control of this instrument. It does not do anything unless I make it move. Therefore, it is not an autonomous robot. What it is, is unlike this. So this, once you program it in a factory, will make its own movements. It's not controlled by a human being. So arguably, is this a more advanced machine that we've seen for decades than the robots that we use in surgery? Or are these robots? Because these are still human beings that are covered in robotic machinery to augment their ability, make them stronger, faster, able to fly. So what is the real meaning of robotics? We only have this at the moment, and this is a tele-manipulator. It is a device that we use remotely under our complete control, and that goes back to the original Czech word of robot, master-slave concept. So the next thing, fluorescence. This is something that we've seen increasingly over the years, and we've all now seen videos such as this, 
where you give an injection of an, in, an intravenous injection of a fluorophore, most commonly endocyanine green, and the area which is perfused shows up with this augmented reality overlay image of being green. That tells us this is most likely the optimal point to make your transection and create an anastomosis. And the evidence would suggest that there is an association with a reduction in leak. There is no randomized evidence for this at present, which, which is why there is still some degree of skepticism, but the pooled analysis, the big studies that we've seen in terms of observational studies, all show a tendency towards a lower leak rate. So there must be something in this that we need to investigate further. You use this not as a, a substitute for your judgment or a substitute for the other techniques that you use. This paper by Sami Emil and Professor Wexner shows a, a, an assessment algorithm that a lot of us would use with quadruple assessment incorporating an air leak or a jacuzzi test flexible sigmoidoscopy at the end for endoscopic visualization, the use of ICG, and then looking at robust donuts. This is something coming down the line. I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see a transition away from the use of intravenous fluorophores, and we're going to use um, multispectral and hyperspectral imaging cameras, so you get a view on the right of the screen. So this is with a specialized camera that works a little bit like how pulse oximeters work. And this will show you areas of perfusion without the need of giving dye. The difficulty at the moment is it's difficult to incorporate a 4K high definition image along with a multispectral image as well. But there are companies working on this and we're gonna hear a lot more about this in the coming years. The next image guidance or navigation a spectrum through virtual reality, which is a computer generated world that you will immerse yourself in as an avatar through to augmented reality and mixed reality where graphics are superimposed on your real world view. So we've always had imaging in theater. Orthopedic surgeons use it all the time to look at their um, so as a check x-ray to ensure that the bones are aligned. We see liver surgeons and breast surgeons using ultrasound. Neurosurgeons often use dynamic CT and MRI in their suites so that they can check for, for margins, for example. And that's lending itself to, towards augmented reality because the image on the left, which is a T2-weighted image of a rectal cancer showing a threatened circumferential resection margin by the black lines, that provides us with huge amounts of prognostic information that this patient needs neoadjuvant long course chemo radiotherapy and their reduction in risk would be X percent by having this treatment. Lots of prognostic and predictive information. The problem is, is that image looks nothing like this image, which is the surgeon using a robot trying to do the operation and understand where those margins are. So we need to be able to translate the image on the left to the image on the right while we're operating. And we can begin to do that with clever hardware and clever software. And this is an example of a company that I work with that um, use Microsoft HoloLens, which is a device that you wear as a pair of glasses over your, um, over your eyes. And it allows you to refer back to the anatomy based on the cross-sectional imaging. And it's used increasingly now experimentally in neurosurgery and orthopedics where their bony landmarks are much easier to, to, uh, to recognize, but we're beginning to see its usage either through vasculature and models like this or in the OR itself. And we can use it for both staging, planning, avoiding complications, teaching our students, mentoring. There's lots and lots of things that we can do with it. And there are examples that we've seen already. So we've seen the augmented reality pictures of, um, of fluorescence, for example. And we've seen the use in teaching for looking at gross anatomy, but we need to try and get this into the OR. Technology is not quite there at the moment, but it's getting there. We're beginning to see some of this technology on robotic software. So we can think about the architecture and the vascular vasculature of the liver, for example. Um, but, 
we as surgeons want to be able to eventually do things like this. So this is an example of me using HoloLens in the OR, trying to align the bony pelvis with the rectum prostate urethra onto the patient so I can have a reference. Of course, we can't use this for um, looking at margins yet because we're not as accurate as the one millimeter that we need to be, but this is where the technology is heading. I'm just going to skip that one because it's not really about telementoring and talk about a combination of techniques and image guidance, which is, for example, using radioisotopes with fluorescence. Because the problem with fluorescence is that the laser is, is limited by its depth of penetration. It can only penetrate a millimeter or two to show you a fluorescent structure. And often in the deep fatty pelvis, we can't see lymph nodes because of this. So an example here, this is a case I did with a head and neck surgeon, where you can see on the top left of the screen, the PET MR image shows a hot node. So this patient's got a tongue cancer and we can use a SPECT CT at the time of surgery to locate which side that node's on and then begin to think about how we can use technetium labeled with a colloid and ICG to combine together to reach that node. So we're able to do something like this. So this is me with a near infrared laser. And we have now used a gamma probe to locate that node where it might be to open up the superficial structures and the fat under the skin. And here we can now see our hot node that we can dissect out. Great, okay, so we don't really have a sentinel node concept in colorectal cancer, how can this help us? Well, it helps us like this because the top left image is um, one, again, a T2-weighted MR showing a pelvic sidewall node. That node has got a heterogeneous signal, irregular border, and is most likely going to be a involved node. You can see it if you're lucky in the bottom left image, but that's more of a gynecological node. So it's more superficial. Our nodes that we're looking for are often deeper. But if we use this similar technique, we can get a gamma probe to first locate where the dissection should start. And then once we've made that dissection, the laser can penetrate through and show that node as a highlighted node. And you can use technology such as this. So this is something that I've recently been using and studying, which is a um, gamma probe that I can drop into the XI robot, position it anywhere I want in the abdominopelvic cavity. And it would, it's the size, as you can see, of a small battery. And that will then tell me where that hot node is, I can begin my dissection as Emery showed using those very precise instruments and then switch the firefly mode on to show me where that node is. Now, the last thing, AI and machine learning. So we hear lots about um, these terms and we hear headlines like this about neural networks being more accurate than your doctor. But actually what they're really saying is that a neural network is faster and more efficient at recognizing a pattern than you as a human being. And that's not by any means um, uh, news to anybody, because if you put an arithmetic calculation into a calculator, it will turn up with the answer faster than you can do it on a piece of paper, because there are rules of the game, the computer or the calculator understands it, and it can work faster and more efficiently than you can. How can we apply that to what we do as colorectal surgeons? So this is some of the work that we do in our lab, and this has now been commercialized into a spin-off company. And it looks a little bit like this, that you withdraw the scope and it can detect abnormalities on the mucosa. So using these AI algorithms, it will say, look, look here, this is important. You should look carefully at this. You should think about resecting it, or you should think about biopsying it. And it's a way to add as a decision support. It's augmenting our ability as endoscopists. It's not turning us into robot. The robot is not doing this. We are being augmented in our own ability to find these polyps, which may have been missed normally. You can do the same thing in surgery. So this is an example of a cholecystectomy. And using the same algorithm, it will tell you what part of the operation you're at and perhaps whether you're about to make an error based on hours and hours of footage that you've already fed into it. And the last bit, how does this man, who is a World Cup winning rugby coach for England, relate 
to the surgeon on the right. The reason is, is that we as surgeons very rarely, if ever, as a group, analyze our own outcomes and think about doing something differently. Now, it may be that we're in stellar company today in terms of the delegates as well as the faculty, that everybody looks at their results and thinks about how they can improve. But the sad reality is, is that the vast majority of surgeons in the world don't do that. They may operate on a Wednesday, and until the following Wednesday, they do nothing in terms of trying to improve performance, whether that be through human factors, well-being, or even analysis. That goes against any other performance industry. And here, in the reason I bring up this World Cup winning coach, he brought predictive analytics and analysis of player behavior, player movement, player nutrition, all into his players prior to the World Cup in 2003. And it was through using data and analysis such as this on the left, he brought that into, into the team, which eventually went on a two and a half year um, winning streak. We have these kind of tools at a very basic level now with companies such as CSATs and others. And this is how we can start thinking about analyzing our performance and looking at metrics and seeing where we may be deficient and thinking about how we can improve. And these are all things that I think we're going to get more and more used to as surgeons, um, having shied away from it for, for many years. So that's where the next frontier in surgery comes from. It's these four pillars of image resolution, fluorescence, navigation, performance, and AI, and all under the umbrella of clever robotic theater platforms that are able to integrate all of this um, into one machine. Thank you very much for listening. Wow, thank you Manish. Fabulous talk again, it's so insightful and inspiring. Excellent, thank you so much for, to my distinguished panelists. Uh, thanks for accepting the invitation. So I'm gonna start a quick fire panel round. So starting with Prof Wexner. Prof? Okay, I'm here. Great, thank you so much again. And so one question to each of you just to get you know an insight. So we start a program, for example, in a, we have in Apollo, uh, you know, it's six, seven years old now with the robotics and stuff. Now we do our MDT, but we, we don't have a accreditation program like what you have in the US now. You know, it's been functional in the UK and Europe, and I think US is getting there. Now, what if, so, you know, I think it'll take time to achieve that in India, but in the future, do you think the ACS and the, the, the accreditation program that you have will go and like the JCI go and assess and accredit programs around the world? Yeah, I, I think um, that's an excellent question. Firstly, I'd like to just compliment the other three speakers on, on phenomenal lectures. I, I've heard all of them speak, but I, I always learn from them. Um, secondly, to get back to the question at hand, I think that um, the short answer is yes. Prior to COVID, so this may be the second part I'm gonna to mention today that helps from the virtual environment. Prior to COVID, when I'd asked about international programming, the ACS wasn't quite ready. Now that we've spent the last 18 months doing virtual site visits, I think we're moving more in that direction. And I'm more optimistic um, that we will be able to go through some international site surveys. It, it's not gonna be immediate, but I think people now are more amenable there are some logistics we need to do. In the interim, however, prior to that happening, um, the individual hospitals can still follow the NAPRC standards. So there's nothing to say you can't log on, look at the standards, download the manual, and carry on as if you are seeking accreditation. Because it's not the accreditation itself that will improve the outcomes, it's following the standards that are required for accreditation. So I think that would be the interim step. Great, that's, that's great, that's great, you know, because now we can we have a template, I and mean, if you have the template prospectively, and then we can say, okay, one year of this, and then we submit the data, and that's something to work on. Great, okay. So, Emery. Yes, thank you, I'm here. Good to have you back. So, my, my hospital, we were having discussions saying, oh, robotics going on. So, 
what do you think we should do in the robotics space? Single port, single port or still you think multi-port robotics? Uh, yeah, I think multi multi port is still the standard for sure, and definitely the the, the upgrades in the robotic technology. I don't know which uh, which model you you guys have uh, is certainly uh, an evolution, and SI uh, was replaced by XI, as you know. I think that's time to switch to that, especially if you're talking about colorectal surgery. It provides a lot of advantages, faster docking, multi quadrant approach, and all that. But SP is something we have been in, at our center exploring widely. Uh, I performed completion proctectomies. Uh, and, but I think the, where it's gonna accelerate is for SP is really endoluminal surgery, I think. It's a, a semi-flexible platform. It's not a fully flexible platform, but it really shines in the intraluminally. Uh, I don't think really SP, at least with the current version will be the answer for a single port surgery, the completion proctectomy, there were some challenges with that. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I think uh, for the time being, still the XI multi port is the way to go in the abdomen at least. Uh, but SP is, uh, has a lot of potential and gonna, uh, gonna be a segue into the future, I think, with especially endoluminal surgery. And I also like, uh, Steve, uh, uh, I like to congratulate, congratulate all the other speakers. I really learned a lot from all of them. Uh, I mean, the COVID, you know, they, were, they delayed us uh, for, 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 for us, us 18 months for many aspects, but I, I don't think any of us did sit on our bottoms and did not do any, anything. And I think that gave us time to revamp and work on our clinical work. And we are all excited to, you know, share that with, uh, with, 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 the, with the many other audience around the world. Fabulous, great. Delia. You know, you, you made the talk so simple, you know, just, yeah, you put a port, shower some pipe back, high pack. I'm sure it's challenging. So to set up a program, I'm sure there are a lot of components to it. And I think, do you think subspecialization in peritoneal disease? I know you will do colorectal cancer, but, you know, I, do you think somebody wants to do that? There is a whole new world out there to, to go and specialize and set up a program. Thank you, thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you again for having me um, and to congratulate all the other speakers that talks were amazing. Um, yes, there is a, in Europe, we have the European School of Peritoneal Surface Oncology. It is a program of two years and you have to take several exams. You have to uh, go and uh, to stay to the several units, uh, learning about the procedures. And this is to be trained in cytotactive surgery and HIPEC. Uh, I am running one course, the first uh, course worldwide on minimal invasive surgery uh, for, for peritoneal disease. We are teaching our students uh, how to do laparoscopic peritonectomy with cadaver, uh, laparoscopic HIPEC and PIPEC. And to can uh, perform PIPAC, you have to be certified. You have to attend one of the courses of the International Society of Pleuram Peritoneum. We are having our next course uh, next week on Switzerland. I will be one of the faculty there. And you have to be a certified to, to can perform PIPAC, mainly because it's a very uh, novel procedure and you have to deal with a uh, high pressure injector with a cabinet and we have to deal with a different technology that general surgeons or colorectal surgeons we are not used to. But there was a very interesting question. So uh, thanks to the European School of uh, Peritoneal Surface Oncology, we have a, a pathway to, to get trained in, in peritoneal surface oncology. Fabulous, thank you, uh, Delia. Anish, hi. So we, hi, we, we, yeah, we've been discussing to run away or uh, take a break, different parts over the last one and a half years, it's not happening. One wave, two waves, three waves, and I don't know, four, five, I don't know. So when we get to make, take that break and say, wherever, suppose we're in Dubai, for example, and I still have a case to do in Chennai, do you think, in the next five years, we will still be in Dubai before we start our party for the evening. We'll still be able to, I will be able to dock on somewhere in a machine or a, whatever and do a surgery back in Chennai. Do you think that's feasible? Basically, uh, saying now we're connected 
by a while, this while will go and 5G, 6G will come into play. Do you think that's going to happen? Yeah, so, so I think um, what, what, what we've seen in the last year and a half is that um, it is possible for any industry to leverage technology and expertise from any other industry. And we saw um, Formula One racing car teams building ventilators. We've seen uh, um, logistic companies helping in delivering vaccines, you know, Amazon delivering vaccines in the States. You know, there, there are all kinds of expertise we can leverage from each other. And I think we've often been very slow to do that in healthcare. So I think one of the things that we are going to see is that process speeding up. And have we got the technology for you to do a, to you to get on a console in um, Chennai and uh, jointly do a case with Emory in Cleveland? The answer to that is yes, we've had that technology for a decade. It's not new. We just don't use it and we haven't leveraged it. So the answer now is that how can we leverage that technology in a cost-effective and a safe way? And, and yes, we will see that. We're already seeing telementoring are becoming becoming more common, um, uh, and and I think we're going to we're going to see the use of five G and high speed internet and uh, and telecommunication technologies that have been in existence for a long time incorporated into our practices to make it not because it's it's good to do for the sake of doing it it's more efficient, you know it is as much fun as it is for Emery me Steve Delia to come to Chennai for a clinical case to do with you, it is if we can do the same thing and lend the same expertise without leaving our own institution, clearly that's a more efficient green thing to do rather than tra travel however many thousands of miles on a plane to get there. So, so I think we're going, to, we're going to see a lot, of, a lot of leveraging technology and expertise from other industries to help us improve outcomes for our patients. Thank you, Manish. So the answer is yes. So party's on, where are we are. And the, my last uh, chat was going to be with Dr. Bandari thanking, thanking you. I have one question for you. When the physical meeting starts, can you please invite us all, please? Be before but, that, before that, let me let me have my privilege to thank uh, such an excellent panel as a surgeon and associated with robotics for almost 16 years, I have a carry, you guys have given me a carry home message and which is indelibly marked. Beginning uh, in a different order, Delia told that never give hope. She has positioned herself between uh, the end of road for chemotherapy or means and hospices. So never give hope. It is a huge compliment with HIPEC and PIPEC. We had a similar discussion on ovarian cancer with the international panel, and this message resonates to me very well. Emery talked about uh, technology, and here I would like you all experts to think about it. We are so definitively biased towards the level of evidence. And till date, I was talking to Lonnie Smith about a few weeks ago. Till that, he was asking me a question that there is no level of evidence proving that robotic is superior, it's a non-inferior. But the why it has become success according to him is because it has been so well received by the patients as well as the surgeons. So that is the point I want to bring in. Uh, most of the techniques uh, have compared robotics for the outcomes. Whereas where I find the value of robotics is how it has made mediocre sur surgeons to perform excellent surgery of high-end surgery, a complex. Take example in urology, IVC thrombus, you know, which used to be a nightmare and we used to prepare with anesthetists for subhepatic thrombus in kidney tumor for months together, still on an average 10% mortality on table. And now, N number of publications, patients walking home at three o'clock without with 100 cc of blood loss. So how do you account for advantage of technology, which has really technology has leveraged? Dr. Wexner brought a wonderful point on quality consciousness, which has an unending scope. And uh, uh, I am very influenced with the, the work done by our neighbors at University of Michigan on bariatric surgery 
And similarly, I was very happy first time to see that. Uh, Manish talked, gave a peep into the technology and I have one question from him. Incidentally, I also work with computer vision models. We are also struggling with the rest of the world for the registration and tracking of the virtual images and giving an effective surgeon interface. Uh, uh, what I find is that it is much easier for using technology like HoloLens or anything for critical steps. We are working on live donor nephrectomy rather than technology is not there to do the whole procedure at the same time, particularly for soft tissue organ. So it had been a wonderful panel, uh, a lot of learning experience for me. And I once again, thank you. And gentlemen, don't think it is the last time I'm counting on you. Uh, I have good channels and I look forward to invite you again and have this wonderful benefit to the large audience you have benefited. Thank you, Venki. And about the physical meetings, I think best would be two persons to answer, either if you have a contact with the COVID-19 virus or okay. else ask an astrologer because my guess would be as good as theirs. Absolutely, absolutely. And as soon as we restart, I think I'm so looking forward to connecting again. Thank you all, fabulous to have you all on a weekend and you, you, all of you sparing your time. I hope the attendees benefited from this session, from these masters. I, I learn every time I talk to them and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you.